Organize Me Radio, episode 54, Make Space for Happiness. I'm Naima Ford-Goldson. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Organize Me Radio. I'm Naima Ford-Goldson, and today's guest is the author of Make Space for Happiness, and she is the owner and CEO of Declutter Fly. Please welcome Tracy McCubbin. Welcome, Tracy. Hello. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here, Tracy. Um, I'm so excited to talk about your book, Make Space for Happiness. Um, But can you first tell us how you got your start in the organizing industry? Uh, it's, <laughs> so uh, I'm one of those people, uh, I st- I've been in business for almost 17 years and I started it sort of right around turning 40. Um, so people could do the math on that. You know, I was, I was one of those people who I did a lot of jobs and sort of careers. And I was like, ah, oh, this isn't quite for me. This isn't quite for me. And I spent quite a long time being a personal assistant to two different people. And I loved it. And I loved that it was problem solving and always different. And, you know, and, and so my last boss that I worked for, he would tell his friends like, oh, you should call her. She can help with this little project. Like I need my garage cleaned out or my Christmas ornaments. And I started doing more and more and more. And I loved, and at first I wasn't even charging. It was just fun. And I didn't even know being a professional organizer was a career. And all of a sudden it's like, I joke, my little flip phone started blowing up. And a friend of mine was like, this is a business. And I was like, what? No, this is just how I help people. And he's like, that can be a business. So I created Declutterfly and it blew up. We've been, you know, busy. I'm I've got 12 employees now and we are, it's just great. We're just, I love it. I love, 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 love what I do. So I think for me, it was a kind of all the things, this is a good lesson for people who are out there trying to find their purpose and passion. You know, all the things that came before I was a secretary and I worked in a typing pool, you know, I I knew how to do books, like all these other life experiences came together. And I was like, oh, I have so much information to give people. So that's how the business came about. I love that. It's always interesting to me to hear everyone's story, like what their background is, because with organizers, you know, maybe now kids growing up, maybe they might say they want to be a professional organizer. But, you know, when we were kids, that wasn't a thing. (laughs) (laughs) No, no. And another really important part of the puzzle that took me a long time to actually put together, but I grew up the child of a hoarder. So my father has extreme hoarding disorder and I spent, I just watched it my whole life. You know, my mom divorced him partly because of it. And so I I went into this when I started my business, I sort of had a very, very um, deep understanding of how it's really as much about our emotional attachment as to putting systems into place. Got it. Okay. So we're going to talk about your book, Make Space for Happiness, but you also published a book in 2019. Can you tell us about that book and what that book is about? Sure. So the uh, first book is called Making Space Clutter Free, the last book on decluttering you'll ever need. And what that book was born out of was at the time, 15, 14 years of being an organizer. And I just kept seeing that we all we all had these stories that we told ourselves about why we can't let go of the stuff that we don't want, need, or use. It's like, well, I paid a lot of money for it, or I might need it someday, or that reminds me of when my kids were little. So I came up what I call the seven emotional clutter blocks, these stories. And, and it's so interesting. We all tell them they're all the same for everybody. It doesn't matter if you're working with a young couple who just had a baby or downsizing, you know, people in their eighties. We all get attached. So it was about helping people understand what the story they were telling themselves and why they were attached to the stuff. And then in that understanding, being able to let go of the things that you don't need. And make space for happiness. What is the main concept? So it's so funny because everyone's like, you told us that was the last book on decluttering. And I'm, <laughs> so this book was born out of, I kept, I, you know, been doing this for a long time. And especially during the pandemic, I would get calls from clients and be like, remember all that stuff we decluttered? Well, I bought it all again Mm -hmm. and then some. And I realized that we cannot talk about decluttering 
and organizing, if we're not talking about our acquisition, if we're not talking about what we're buying, you know, you can declutter all you want, but if you're still at Marshall's every weekend or at home goods and, you know, buy, you know, buying new throw pillows, you're still going to have it coming in. So I wanted to address what, what we think is missing, what we think that we're going to fill inside of ourselves with stuff. So sort of the opposite of the clutter blocks, I realized that we have these clutter magnets. We have these almost like little holes inside of ourselves that we think the stuff is going to fix. So it's everything from self-confidence, you know, all those anti-aging beauty products to self-respect logos all over your purses to free time, you know, to true connection. We're starting work with this lovely couple. Oh my God, they're so lovely. They're in their seventies. And she self-admittedly, she was like, I have been shopping like a drunken sailor through the whole pandemic. Like I can't <laughs> even go into a room. And so we started talking about like what that was like. And she, you know, and I said, well, tell me, you know, your experience in the pandemic and tell me what happened. And she said, you know, well, I retired from my job that was very social. I went to an office every day. So I retired, the pandemic hit. I stopped being able to go to church in person. I started watching it on the video and I stopped playing bridge. And I was like, you took all of your connectivity, all your social connections out of your life. No wonder you started shopping. Like you might as well have gone to Vegas and gone gambling because you were missing something. So the first, it was so cute because I said, well, can we just start? Like, do you feel comfortable? Can you go back to church in person, wear a mask? And she's like, yeah, I'm, I'm getting ready to do that. And I said, how about bridge? And her husband's like, there's a game this afternoon. I'll drive you right now. <laughs> So she was realizing that her connection to her community had been taken away and she was trying to fill it up with shopping. So my next question was, why do people attract clutter? But I feel like you kind of answered that just now. Um, do you have anything else to add to that? Yeah, I think that we we think this stuff is going to fix us. We think that that we're one product away from it fixing us. Um, you know, we, we also, we sort of use it as a distraction to not be in our feelings. Like, oh, if I'm, you know, I, I talk, a lot of people I work with who are, you know, I, it's a big word to use shopaholics, but over shop, you know, it's always like, well, I was super stressed or my mom's sick or my kid, you know, there's always some emotional thing. And I'm not, it's funny. I'm not a minimalist. I'm not saying don't ever shop again. But I am saying, if it's not working, if you're spending more than you're making, if your house is so full, let's look at the root of what's going on. And are there other ways that you can satisfy that without the shopping, which AKA leads to the clutter. So then what can listeners do to stop attracting the clutter? This is my favorite. This is my favorite. This is something we can all do starting right now. Stop saying, I need about stuff. I need a new pair of jeans. I need some new throw pillows. I need, I need, I need. 99.9% .9 of the time, you do not. You have plenty of jeans in your closet. You've got cute pillows. You want them. So just changing the languaging to say, oh, you know what? I want a new pair of jeans. It takes the like, heat off of it. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, actually, I'm fine. Those jeans are great. Uh, th that makes it work. If you stop telling yourself that you need it and then start to look at why do I think I needed it? Am I not feeling good about myself today? So I think a new pair of jeans are going to zazz me up. So it's such an easy switch to make. And it's just a languaging thing. And all of a sudden you're like, oh no, you know what I need? I need my family. I need my community. I need, you know, I need to be of service. I need to have a gratitude practice. Like all the things that we know serve us so much better. And it's such an easy, easy switch to make. I think it's interesting that you, you said that change your language because once you change your language, then your mindset starts to change. So I, I got that. Okay. I got that little <laughs> nugget. Okay. Yeah. And also, you know, if you're walking around, like I need a spiralizer and I need an Instapot, you're telling yourself that you're in a place of scarcity, right? That you're telling yourself, oh, I don't have enough and something's missing in my life instead of like, oh no, I have plenty. I have almost too much. And if there's, if i feel that, where else can I get it? Um, you know, what, what else can I 
where else can I fill that part of myself? And that that's the goal that not, don't, I'm not going to say don't ever shop because it's impossible. But if you have these needs, where can you get them met in another way? Okay. So can we talk Marie Kondo? Because recently yes. she came out <laughs> and she oh. said... <laughs> She came out and she said, uh, basically, you know, what she was teaching people, you know, now that she has kids, it's completely different. I know a lot of us organizers kind of saw it as a gimmick in the first place, but what are your thoughts on the KonMari method of organizing? Um, well, I, I know that there were a whole bunch of us organizers out there were like, yep, that's about right on schedule. Kid number three, that'll do it. <laughs> you know, I think that for me, you know, I, I think that she started a conversation, especially in the United States, that we weren't having, and it was very, very valuable. But the, I thought her point of view was not nuanced. It was like it didn't take into, you know, how I organize a studio apartment or a studio loft for one person living by themselves is very different than how I organize a party, a family of five. You know, that organization and systems and the amount of stuff it depends. And she was like, nope, it's this way. You get 30 books. You need to take six months off of your job. It, it wasn't realistic for me. And, you know, I had a lot of clients who, I got a lot of clients who were like, I read the book. I pulled everything out. My house is a disaster. Can you help me? And I don't think she took into account that she just didn't take into account the emotional component of it. Yeah. Yeah. I remember watching, I only watched one or two of her episodes and I watched one where I'm from California and I grew up in central California. So a lot of people that that's where the internment camps were that the Japanese families were put into. And so I actually work with a lot of families here in LA whose parents are grandparents and they have so much clutter. And for me, it's like, well, of course, because everything was taken away from you. Like you left, sent to this horrible place and you came back and it was all gone. Yeah. And like, no wonder. And like talking that through and generational trauma. And I watched an episode where she was working with this family, a Japanese American, and they, they had a lot. And at the very end, they were like showing her this photo album of their time as kids in the internment camp. And I'm like, wow, how did you go through a whole thing and not address that? Like yeah. that has such an effect. Like I tell people that all the time, like, you know, if someone in your family was a Holocaust survivor or didn't survive, you're going to have a different relationship to photos. If you're, you know, just like if were your parents immigrants, what is that? That's a whole di different thing. Like, I just think she just made it so simple. And guess what? After she had kid number three, not so simple. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. I, I appreciate that you said that because organizing is is not a one size fits all you know you have to take into account what the person is going through what they might be going through a divorce they might be a widow you know a death of a loved one like that will change up how someone functions you know the loss of a job there are so many different life events that happen that can just change up how you operate in your home and you know, because of that, then you can start to build up clutter or have issues with decluttering or not know where to start and things just pile up. So I think that's very important that you mentioned that, um, that, you know, we're yeah. all different. Yeah. We're, we're all different. And I think that the personal organizers that are successful are the ones that understand that, you know, I'm very, very, as all of us are, you know, very anti storage units. Don't get a storage unit. You just burn money. You know, it's ridiculous. But I get a call recently from a woman whose mother had died. I think she was probably in her thirties. Maybe she was, you know, but her mom, you know, her mom had died and her dad got a new girlfriend right away. And he moved the new girlfriend into the house and the woman, the daughter, the grown daughter just had had a baby. And so she couldn't fly to help her dad clean out the house. So the new girlfriend was just starting to throw everything away, like all of her mom's stuff. She hadn't right. had a chance and she was, you know, and I was like, look, I never say this, call a moving company, get a cousin, a friend, FaceTime with them, pack it all up and put in storage. You will never, like when your kid's a little older and you can go through and you can go through it, but 
if this keeps going, you will resent your, you know, it's just, and so sometimes we have to bend our own rules for what the person's going through. I couldn't agree more. So can you tell us some of your top decluttering tips? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, so well, my favorite one around clothes is I always tell people, um, do you feel beautiful when you wear it? Like, do you feel beautiful when you wear it? Um, if you saw it in the store again, would you buy it again today? That's always a good one. And if you put something on and take it off, like put it on, they go, oh, this isn't quite right. Take it off three times. You're never going to wear it. Just mm. let it go. Understanding a good one. Like if you have a thing, you're like, oh, but I might need it someday. Can you reasonably buy it again or borrow it from someone else? Is it costing you more? Are you storing it in a storage unit for $300 a month because the someday that maybe won't ever happen? You know, it's, it's a very, very practical about it, you know, and understanding. So in the first book, Making Space Clutter Free, I go through all of like the whole house and your seven emotional clutter blocks and people, it's just, it's great. It's just changing people's lives. It's great. So for someone who is um, overwhelmed with all of the clutter that they've accumulated, what do you recommend for them? How should, how should they start? Terrific. Couple things. First of all, the first thing that I always tell people is get really clear, and this goes back to mindset, why you want to declutter. Why do you want to get organized? And I don't want to hear that you're lazy or you're a bad housekeeper or you, you know, no negativity. You know, I want to clean out my guest room so my grandkids can come and stay. I want to be able to park my car in the garage. I want to like get my paperwork in order so I can deal with my taxes. Because when you have a clear, concrete goal that's going to better your life, you're much, you know, it's going to keep you motivated. And I'm a big fan of starting small, you know, especially if it's difficult for you. I do these challenges on Instagram, do about two or three a week where I do five minute decluttering challenges. Here's something you can do in five minutes, coffee mugs, old socks, and you start to do these little bite-sized chunks. And for people who are overwhelmed or for people who it's difficult, a little five minutes here, a little 10 minutes, and then all of a sudden you start to be successful at it. You start to feel the payoff of decluttering. You're like, oh, okay, I can do this. I can do this. And also don't start with the hard stuff. Don't start with the photos. Don't start with the letters. Just don't. <laughs> you know, I think so many people kind of dive into the most difficult stuff. And then you're like, oh no, no, no wonder you got derailed. So I'm all about setting you up for success, having you be successful and then building on it. So what about the people who have trouble letting go? How do you ease them into that process or how can they motivate themselves to ease themselves into that process of decluttering? So for people who have trouble letting go, I always like to say that maybe boxing everything up and taking it to like a big box donation place like Goodwill or Salvation Army, that might not be good for you. You may need to know that the stuff that you're getting rid of is being used by somebody, right? Like, so maybe it's your neighbor or, um, you know, a, a, somebody across the street had a new baby and you've got all your kids clothes. Sometimes if you can donate to a smaller nonprofit, we work a lot, my company works a lot with a couple organizations that help kids that are aging out of the foster care system into apartments. So they'll call us and say, hey, we've got, we just, you know, two people are moving into, I'm like, oh, great. I got a bed. I got a dresser, you know, and it's so, so when my clients are like, wait, what, where's this going? Who are you helping? Oh, okay. You know what? I got more. I actually got more. So if it's really hard for you to let go, maybe finding a place where it's going to have a little bit more of a direct impact makes it easier because at the end, we all want to help each other. And so I always think that that, that's such a great a great way. I, I just got a DM on um, Instagram just this morning. This woman said, I just have to tell you, I had my mom's China in a chest. I've had it for 20 years and I've used it twice and I don't like it, but I feel guilty. And she was like, I tried to sell it as we know, nobody's buying old China. No. And she was like, and then I realized our favorite restaurant they use mismatched old china as their table setting. She was like, I took a couple pieces. We went to dinner. The owner freaked out 
I've given it all to them. She's like, and they set a little place setting aside. So for whenever we come in, we get it. And I was like, just think, I texted her, emailed her back and said, you know, just think that this thing that had been clogging up your house was now going to be a part of people's celebrations. They're going to be people celebrating, getting engaged and birthdays over that China. Like how amazing is that? So I really do suggest if it's hard for you to let go, to find a place that speaks to you. Okay. So now there are some people who feel like, um, they might not ever achieve a level of organization that they're satisfied with, um, meaning maybe they won't be happy with it. Is happiness possible for for all of us? Yes, I, it is. I also think that we really need to understand, and those of us who do it every day, all day, we know organizing is a regular decluttering and organizing is a regular task you don't just do it once and it's done you know it becomes part of your weekly routine like you know i always say if you can't tidy a room up and get it back to the way you like it in 20 minutes or less the clutter's gotten an up an upper hand so i think we have to let go of this expectation that you're gonna get it perfect because there is no perfect. And as your life changes, maybe what you need, you know, one of my favorite things, and my moms do this all the time, is that they they will make a little basket to put it near the breakfast table um, so that when the kids are eating, they can brush their hair and get sunscreen on them and like get them out the door. And it makes sense for them. But as you get older and those kids, the kids are doing their hair in their bathroom, you don't need that anymore. So I think we all need to understand that organization is not perfect but it's fluid. And then the more that you understand how your home works and what you need it to do, then you're like, oh, okay, this is, it's, it's like, it's, it's like, oh, I need to tweak this to make it be better. That's, that's really like, it's not about beating yourselves up. I don't care what your house looks like on Pinterest. I really don't. I want your house to work for you. I love that. I think those are some really, really good tips. I hope people are really listening because you have given us some great information. Um, can you tell me what are your favorite organizing products? Uh, I love a couple of them. I love, it's not pretty, but the um, white expandable spice drawer insert where it sits your spices up on a little angle. Mm -hmm. That's the greatest thing ever invented. And by the way, gets turmeric or curry powder all over it, wash it, put it back in. Those things last forever. That one is a game changer because it gets your spices where you can use them. I love that. Um, I love the twirly roundabout from iDesign, you know, the compart, I have it under my bathroom sink, my hair products are in it. You know, I love that. I really do like, I really like those iDesign bins, the ones that, or the ones that they sell at the container store. I think they're great. And I think I'm not a big over binner. Like I don't have bins in my refrigerator for me. I just won't ever keep it up, but I do think you know, that containing things and those clear bins that you can see through. The nice thing about the clear bins is then you don't have to label it because you're like, oh, that's all hair products. So that's all that, you know, so I'm a, I'm a big fan of a clear bin. Right. Okay. Love those. Okay. Now, can you also tell me what is your greatest achievement, your greatest professional achievement? I had a woman, I worked with a woman who um, I think was low on low on the scale of hoarding disorder. I think she had a bit of it, but I actually think it was more that she was dealing with depression or not dealing. And so her house got, her apartment got bad. We cleaned it out, organized it. And um, she, I mean, she hadn't had a plumber in, in 10 years to fix her dishwasher. So her dishwasher was broken. She called me and she said, Tracy, for the first time in 12 years, a friend was down the street and they called me and said, hey, do you want to meet for a cup of coffee? And she said, and I was able to say, why don't you come to my house? She um, had a friend in her home for a cup of coffee. She hadn't been able to share her house for 12 years. Wow. Wow. And it's like, you, you think of the impact that that has on someone, you know? And it's like, I feel like it's the little things, like something as little as that for some of us, you know, who might have people over all the time or don't have to rush to clean things before people come. Um, for someone like that to where they can just invite someone in, like, oh my God, yeah. how? 
And how, you know, and also to think that for her, that she was walking around like, oh, I hope somebody doesn't come by. I hope something doesn't break. Like the stress of that, that she was carrying and to be able to like say, I could open my home. She's like, it wasn't perfect. I'm like, nobody's home was perfect. But you had a friend, you got to connect with a human over a cup of coffee in your space. Your space got filled with a little bit more love that day. That is the, just, you know, that that one always sticks with me. It always sticks with me. I love that. Tracy, thank you so much for joining us and sharing information about your book and sharing your stories. Can you tell everyone how they can find out more information about you and where they can purchase your books? Absolutely. So the newest book is called Make uh, Make Space for Happiness, How to Stop Attracting Clutter and Start Magnetizing the Life You Want. They're available um, Amazon, bookshop.org, Barnes and Noble. The audiobook, I read it. So if you you know, want to have me in your ear for a couple hours. Um, also, almost every library in the United States carries it. I'm a big fan of the public library. So almost every library, if they don't, they can get it. And um, Instagram is my biggest platform, at Tracy underscore McCubbin. We do these challenges. It's super positive, super supportive. Come join me over there. And as always, TracyMcCubbin.com. Tracy, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you everyone for joining us. Be sure to tune in next time for an all new episode.